Welcome to the Heart of Poland programme on the impossible mission to try and uncover the heart of Poland. Now who better to talk to a subject like this than Roger Morehouse, one of the few but very important English language historians on Polish history. Roger fell in love with Polish history when he watched Poles retake their country back in 1989 and this love affair has continued, not limited of course to working with Mr Norman Davies. We're going to talk to him about that and some of the projects he's working on Polish history for the future. Roger, thank you very much uh, for joining us. And we're in a special room. This is not our typical uh, recording, so it's, I guess it's a special guest for a, for a <laughs> special room for a special uh, episode. I'm going to ask you straight away uh, uh, to show us the special item you've yeah, us. Yeah, um, I know you're from our correspondence that ran up to this. Uh, you talked about bringing a prop, you know, something that sort of explains um, my connection to Poland. And my connection is very unashamedly Norman Davies. Um, and that goes right back to my student days. Um, I was born in 68 and uh, remember very clearly the, you know, the events leading up to 89, which for me was, was massive. Of course, it was massive for Poland and most of Central Europe. But for me, it was, it was kind of like some sort of awakening. So um, I found it absolutely fascinating. I was, you know, rush home from work and watch it on the news and so on. Um, and in a sense, that's, that uh, crystallised my fascination with Central Europe. Um, and after that, it was after, you know, after the events of 89 that I um, went to university specifically to study Central European history um, and ended up on a course with Norman Davies, who was uh, Which is was kind fantastic. of like winning the lottery for me. Yeah, it was, it was marvellous. I mean, it, that, that wasn't, to be fair, that wasn't until my third year. So I had, um, I had some brilliant lecturers and other subjects and so on. I always knew of Norman, he was sort of, uh, you know, one of the luminaries of the college, so he certainly knew that he was there. But I didn't really come into his orbit properly until my third year. Um, and uh, he was, was and is brilliant, uh, and, you know, hugely influential. Um, and I ended up working for him as research assistant for many years, and, and really, um, it's no exaggeration to say the reason I'm sitting here is because of Norman Davis, as simple mm. as that. So. So uh, I, I want to go back to that moment where these, you know, these strikes, you know, all sorts of things, there's f some information feeding back to mm. Western broadcasters. Did it sort of, it inspired you? Thought, I want to go out and find more about these people because I knew so little about them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, mean, I think there's, it's been said many times. I think it's even been said on one of your, one of your uh, recordings, one of your podcasts, that, that the, there's a real feeling, I think, certainly in Britain, that you know, um, history sort of stops at the Elbe. You know, there's, there's no real knowledge of what's beyond Berlin sort of thing. Uh, I think there's something in that. And, and, it's, and it's really a sort of very much a one-eyed view of history that we have. It's certainly, you know, Polish history isn't taught in schools, which I uh, fervently believe it should be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there, there, for me, in, in part, you know, what was going on 88, 89, um, was the fascination was that I actually, I actually was planning to do a, do a sort of, um, I had a motorbike at the time and I was planning, sounds very silly now, um, I was planning to do a motorbike tour um, through Central Europe uh, and the thing that put me off bizarrely was that I, had, I would have to have to get entry and exit visas for each place that I went which, which was prohibitive because <laughs> uh, everything cost so if to go into the GDR you had to buy you know, some entry and exit and then in, into Czechoslovakia and so on so uh, so that's what put me off in the end. But I was actually planning that for 1989. And then, you know, the, 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 the costs put me off. So, um, no, it was very much, it's kind of, you know, terra incognita. For, for, it still is, I suppose, for many British people. It's just, it's over there. It's over there in the East. And, and they, they, they don't have any real handle on it, which is a great shame. Um, you know, I've sort of, I've done a lot of German history, but I'm sort of increasingly getting drawn into Polish history, which is partly because I find it fascinating. Uh, and I, I, I hope to try and, you know, um, bring more British and, and, and uh, you know, Anglophone readers into this fascinating world. We're going to come on to some of the projects you're working on and the things you're doing. I want to go uh, to those student days working with Norman Davies. Mm. So, you know, most foreigners who want to try and understand Poland read all of his books, or at least some of them as well. Uh, what would you... Why is it... I mean, it's rather ironic that one of Poland's best historians is... 
not Polish. Yeah. What, what is it that Norman brings to the table? <laughs> really... um, that's a very good question. I mean, he's got a very... I mean, I suppose there's a, there's a public Norman and a private Norman. Um, but he does... I mean, in terms of historianship, he always takes a different view. You know, that he never sort of follows the convention. He always has a slightly, slightly different take on things. Um, in some, you know, rightly or wrongly in some cases. But I think that's one thing that sort of sets him apart, that you're always going to get an orig original opinion from him. Um, his writing is very, very strong, is all, has always been. I mean, for me, working with him as a, as a research assistant was, was very much like an old-fashioned apprenticeship, really. Um, you know, and I, we used to, when we were writing Microcosm, the, the history of Rotswaf, which we wrote together, uh, and we would literally sort of bounce text um, I wouldn't say by email, though some of it was by email, but Norman then wasn't terribly good at email, so it, it was very often scribbled text and put in the post, and then it would get scribbled on and sent back again. Um, but it was, it was a real apprenticeship, so he used to send it back, and it would have marginal notes and saying, you know, what are you trying to do here, and <laughs> things like that. So it was, really, it was, a, it was a, a wonderful apprenticeship, really. So I think, I think you know, I, I have a, a tremendous admiration for him. Now, you, uh, you focus mostly hitherto, at least, on, on the Third Reich as your, uh, in most of your life's work up until as a historian. Uh, what is it that fascinates you about that particular period of German history? Mm. Um, it still does. I mean, it's still, I still find it fascinating. I've, I've, as I said, I've kind of increasingly drawn into Polish things, but um, the Third Reich is... is uh, I mean, obviously, it's, it's sort of larger than life. It's one of those enormous events that you really can't escape as a historian. And I think a lot of what I try and do, regardless of what subject I'm doing, is to, is to try and look at the complexity. So get away from the simplified version of history, because you, there's always a simplified, you know, prepared, single-paragraph story, this is what happened. Uh, and it's, uh, by definition of being a simplified version, it's almost, you know, you know, it's full of errors, and it's full of mistakes, and it's full of mythology. Um, so there's, that's one of the things that sort of drives me along. Um, and there's a, lot, there's a lot of questions within, you know, the study of the Third Reich, you know, the, the degree of complicity amongst ordinary people, for example, the degree of knowledge of the Holocaust, that sort of thing. There's all these, there's a tremendous amount of, of still very grey areas in the historical record, which, uh, you know, it's, it's great fun to actually dive into that and to try as far as is possible with the sources that you have to address those questions. And I tried to do that, for example, with, um, with my book, Berlin at War, um, where I addressed that, tried to address that question of, of knowledge of the Holocaust as far as it's possible to do so. Mm. Um, and killing uh, Hitler, for example, you know, everybody knows about 21st of July, Stafford yeah, Burke. But yeah. you, you also I mean, that's another one where, where you know, you've, got, you've got the headline act, you've got the single paragraph, you know, Stauffenberg tried to kill Hitler and so on. And actually, when you look into it, you, there are many more. No, not least the Poles, of course, as well, who, who had a couple of attempts. But people like Georg Elsa, who actually, I mean, I think largely coincidentally, but I, I wouldn't mind uh, taking a small modicum of, of credit for it. I think the way that Georg, the story of Georg Elsa has sort of broken in the way that it has, I think, you know, that's, I'd like to think that's partly to do with me, because that's a fantastic story. You'll have to tell me in brief and tell our viewers as well, because I have to admit I haven't uh, read the book. So, I mean, Georg, Georg Elsa um, was an ordinary, uh, sort of trained, um, uh, as the Germans would say, a hand worker. Uh, he was from southwestern Germany, from, from Schwaben. Uh, and in 1939, he decided that uh, Hitler was bad news and he was going to try and kill him. Uh, Single-handedly, he didn't tell anybody. Um, he set about his task uh, very methodically. He was, he was probably on the spectrum, as we would say these days. <laughs> That's a fascinating character. Didn't tell anybody. Um, set out sort of testing explosives, built his own detonator, all this sort of thing. So real, you know, the archetypal lone wolf. Um, ended up planting a bomb in a beer hall in Munich uh -huh. where Hitler was giving a speech in uh, uh, November 1939. Uh, the bomb went off as planned. Um, Elsa himself was at that moment trying to cross the border into Switzerland. Um, Hitler's speech, the, the speech that he was making at the time was, caught, was cut short because he had to get the train back to Berlin. So normally he would have flown and uh, were there not fog on the ground at the time, 
he would have flown, and that would have meant that uh, uh, he would have done the full-length speech, and he almost certainly would have been killed because the whole roof of this beer hall was pulled down by Elsa's bomb. So circumstances uh, denied Elsa his moment of fame or infamy as the assassin of Hitler. Um, actually, it was 13 minutes, so Hitler, Hitler missed, uh, left the, the room 13 minutes earlier. The devil's luck, uh, as they say. Absolutely. So, you know, the fact that everyone knows Stauffenberg, yes, fair enough, you know, that was the only one that really injured Hitler, for example. It was the, the closest anyone got to assassinating Hitler. But in the process, and this is what, something that motivated me to write that book, in the process of Stauffenberg being, being raised up as the poster boy of the German resistance, we've forgotten about everyone else. And there's a, there's, there are many other brilliant stories and heroic people like Georg Elsa that have, that have been forgotten. And, and are you always on the hunt for some unknown element? I, I am, because that's what, that's what uh, sort of gets me going as a historian. I think there certainly amongst popular history. I mean, academic historians are a slightly different breed altogether. I, sort of, I do a little, I've got one foot in that, in that field as well, but, you know, it's popular history. I like to communicate to a bigger audience, really. So it's popular history that I, that I enjoy most. But, and there are, within that, I think there are, there are, you know, different shades and different uh, uh, ways of doing things. And some people tend to do what I call that I, I tend to, I'm not in being entirely pejorative, but a little bit, I sort of call it chocolate box history, which is, you know, almost reinforcing that national myths, you know, like yet another book on the Dam Busters, for example. Um, I find that a little bit tedious, to be honest. Uh, so I'd rather, I'd rather look for things that people don't know about and say, and say to a reader, right, you know about this, well, what about this one? Mm. You know, this one is a related story or it's a, a similar tale that you won't have heard of. Uh, a very good example of this is, of course, your book about the Devil's Alliance, mm. the alliance between Nazi Germany and, and Soviet Russia, which should be very well understood out of the Second it World should, War, and yet somehow not. slipped through the gaps. Absolutely. And that's a, that is a very good example. I mean, quite how, um, you know, the relationship between uh, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union for the first almost two years of the war has been sort of routinely ignored by generations, literally generations of historians, is beyond belief. I mean, not, of, not in Poland, obviously, but certainly in the English-speaking world, it's been routinely ignored. Um, so when I, uh, when I started sort of pitching that, um, it was to, 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 a lot of the initial sort of sales of publishers and so on was to say, look, this is a huge story. You know, we treat, certainly in the, in the um, in the school system in Britain, we treat the Nazi-Soviet pact as if, as if it's the, sort of the last chess move before the beginning of the war. That's all it is. It's just a chess move to isolate Poland, you know. But it's much more than that. Mm. It's a relationship over two years. There were four trade treaties between Moscow and Berlin. You know, they, they, they met, Molotov flies to Berlin and meets, uh, meets Hitler in November 1940 for, you know, for talks on, the, on molotov Ribbentrop II, which, we, you know, potentially could have followed. So this is a real relationship. It's a great power relationship that has just been ignored. Is the fact that it's been ignored or forgotten, uh, is it cock-up or cover-up? Um, hmm. You uh, make, I think, no secret of your criticism of some of the Russian state's activities yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, do you see a sort of a part of a history of... Yes, I think in that sense, uh, the Soviet state initially, and it's been perpetuated by, by Putin's Russia, that's certainly true, the Soviet state was rather embarrassed um, after the war about the fact that it spent the first third of the war essentially in cahoots with Hitler, uh, understandably embarrassed, um, and went to great lengths to effectively cover that up, to, to obfuscate in the way that, that uh, the Russian state likes to do, the Kremlin likes to do. Um, Stalin put out a book, in, I think in 1948, under his own name, which was called The Falsifiers of History, which was a wonderful falsification of history, uh, in which he sort of complained that, uh, you know, that the Western world, which had just, actually the American State Department had just produced um, the text of the Nazi-Soviet Pact and the secret protocol, which had been found in German archives. And this had just been published by the American State Department. So Stalin's response was to, was to do this pamphlet called The, the Falsifiers of History which is a barefaced lie. He says, this is nonsense, it never happened, and so on. Molotov goes to his grave, which is remarkably late in 1986, still saying that, that the, the secret protocol was a lie, even though he signed it. 
Well, that brings which us is astonishing. neatly onto one of the victims of, of that particular deal, which is, of course, Poland. Is mm. that how you're, you started to look at Poland, uh, just a little bit more attention at that particular time? Um, I, I mean, I, w- I always had been, you know, right from the beginning, my, uh, my sort of, you know, with Norman and, and beforehand, you know, the whole sort of solidarity movement was an inspiration or so on. Um, so it was always there, but in terms of you know my historianship, I suppose I had Norman was pulling in that direction. Although I was quite, um, in, you know, my my heart was rather more in German, with German history at the time. So I've always, had, there's been uh, you know forces pulling me in that direction. Um, I'd done a, I had done a couple of or a chapter in the Killing Hitler book on the Polish underground. Um, so done various things. I worked very closely with Norman, for example, on his Rising 44 book about the Warsaw mm. Rising. So it wasn't as though I hadn't done any Polish history. I was already quite well versed in it. Um, but the first time I'd really written about it properly myself, I suppose, was uh, doing the Devil's Alliance. Um, and that, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed that. It was, very, it was quite a difficult book, mainly because um, you're so cutting against the grain of everything that's been done before, uh, which is quite, it makes it quite a lonely place in a strange way, because you're the only one saying this, and you sort of wake up in the night saying, but what if I'm wrong? <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's no, there's no kind of, uh, you know, emotional support network in that you have a body of authors who have all said the same thing, and you can kind of put yourself in that imaginary company, you're a little bit on your own, so... Um, yeah, that was that wasn't an easy book to do, but I think it, I think it will stand the test of time. I hope it will. You know, as a as a sort of English language expose of this great power relationship. Yeah. Now we've already talked about the fact that Polish history is not particularly well understood, mm-hmm. and I want to carry on a discussion that I had with Adam Zamoyski, mm-hmm. uh, f- f- certainly a historical uh, friend of yours, so from the from the group of English language authors around yeah. uh, Poland uh, about the way that Poland's past is explained. And this includes by historians, but other people as well. It does seem that we have, we're playing catch up. Mm. The the history has stopped at the Elbe, as as you put it. Uh, And we do seem to have a problem with explaining our history to other people. Is Mm. it because it's so traumatic or we're bad at it? That's a good question. I think think there's a perception, you know, it is it is quite horrific in many ways. I mean certainly the you know the wartime period is literally horrific. A lot of the earlier stuff, you know, look at the period of the partitions, which I I find fascinating. Uh, not just the partitions themselves and the various reactions within Polish society to the to the different partitions and the different reactions within even, you know, there's a whole kaleidoscope of reactions in there. Um, so that's fascinating. But then you look at how that has how the, that experience plays out in later Polish history. You know, I make the point that Poland in '39 was always going to fight, and that, and you've got to you have to read that from its earlier experience of occupation. It's had 20 years of independence, hasn't been brilliantly successful, but it was independence. That was a crucial thing. They were, of course, they were always going to fight for it. So uh, you know things that you have to look at that that um, you know you look at that thing as a, a much longer sort of philosophical have a longer philosophical tale to it. Um, but I think in terms of presentation of the history, it is difficult. It's complicated. You mm. know you have uh, essentially you don't really have a nation state. If you look back beyond you know back to the old Rzeczpospolita, you don't really have a nation state at all. The political institutions involved are very very complex and arcane. So it's a difficult sell. Uh, and it's also, you know, obviously the Lithuania, and it encompasses half of Ukraine, what's now Ukraine. So it's a very difficult sell, right? Where, you know, even if you look at British history, if you look at French history, you know, you've got reasonably delineated borders, and it's, and it's a, a relatively, you know, easier one to understand and get your head around. So there's that aspect. And I think as well, the, the horror of modern history in Poland, the, the elements that are truly horrific, I think it lends itself to a perception that um, the presentation of it is, is over-emotional. And I think it, it almost needs to be toned down, um, that too much of this is, is, is laden with emotion. And that, I think, for some people, might be off-putting. Mm. Well, we talked about this before the programme, which is it's, it's your reading material, which is horrific, uh, and it does seep into the skin. You, know? mm. you can't just stop thinking about that when you, when you put your computer down. For a day, how, how do you find your distance to the, to the, sub, the subjects and stories of Poland's past? Uh, it's not always easy, I have to say. I mean, I remember um, 
reading, I think there were accounts from the Holocaust that, um, I mean, this is going back a while, and I remember reading them and, and just kind of being shocked and revolted, and, you know, the next minute I was sort of sobbing in the corner of the library, you know. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the key traits of a good historian is objectivity. You have to remain objective, you have to sort of almost hover above the material sort of thing, but at the same time, you know, sometimes that's, that's very difficult, you know, when it's particularly emotive, and, and particularly where, you know, again, in a strange way, you know, when, when my uh, children were small, for example, you know, and you certainly read accounts of, you know, I mean, children being murdered in the Holocaust, for example, then that sort of, it, however objective you try and be, that hits home, and it's very difficult to, to remain objective and not to sort of, you know, your, your brain almost automatically puts them in that situation, and it's, it can get very difficult. Um, so it, it is a battle, um, but as I say, you have, to, you have to try and, you know, remain above it whilst at the same time being aware of the emotional impact because what you're doing, certainly as a, pop, as a popular historian, you have to be able to harness that and, and feed that through to your audience to, to provoke an emo emotional reaction in your audience. So it is a, li a little bit of a difficult balancing act. Do you think it's also because you're, you're not Polish? So you don't have, say, the, yeah. the grandfather who was... Uh, I think that helps me, certainly. Uh, I mean, I am, I am uh, as I think Norman once said, polonophilus. Uh, <laughs> Rex, um, so I am, so I am sympathetic, certainly. But uh, no, I don't have a dog in the fight. I mean, I don't have Polish forebears or anything like that. Um, so that probably does help, um, that I'm not sort of thinking what, what, you know, what Grandad would have been doing in 1939 or whatever it is. Um, that certainly probably helps with the objectivity, yeah. And yet, as a historian, you have to pick a subject and then, you know, take that bone and go as far as you can with mm. the material you have. And that also means not talking about things. Uh, I just wonder uh, uh, to what extent a historian sort of uh, fighting on behalf of the nation in order for the story to be better known. Mm. You know, we feel in Poland, uh, certainly many people say this, that you know, our history isn't well known. We, we both confirmed it. Uh, you know, I, I guess I'm asking this question from many different perspectives because... Uh, uh, it's not just a historian's job to try and help a country's history to be known mm. better. But I wonder, do you, uh, do you ever feel sort of torn between uh, essentially being a champion of Polish history mm. in order for it to be better known? Yeah, I mean, that's something I would... Uh, as I said, I'm sympathetic, as I said you know, just now, but I, uh, a champion of Polish history, I'm a little bit uh, balk at. I think that's... A, that's um... As some would say about Norman. Yes, I think they would, um, but I think that's, that's sort of impinging on your objectivity in a way. You, you don't want to be someone who, you know, is is seen as as um, you know will, will always write the positive thing about Poland. I, I hope I hope that won't be said about me, and I don't think it's said about Norman too much anyway. Um, no, I think you have to that again the crucial word objectivity. You've got to remain uh, objective and look at the material. Uh, go where it, where the material tells you to go, and part of the problem I think with Polish history at the moment, I talked about that sort of uh, often that over emotional presentation. Certainly, in uh, modern Poland, um, the its history is extremely politicised at the moment, as you know, um, and to some extent that's a sort of a, you know that's the pen pendulum swinging back post eighty nine. You know, all those all those areas of Polish history that couldn't be talked about under the, under the uh, communist rule. Uh, all the black spots, all of those are being dealt with and are being, you know, documentaries and books and all of that, and that's all very good. That's all normal and fine. But there's, in a sense, the, the, the pendulum is kind of swinging and swinging, and the, the history becomes very politicised. And that's something that, again, I think a lot of us uh, historians dealing with the subject have to kind of step back from that overt politicisation because that's, that's uh, getting into fields that historians aren't necessarily good at. Mm. You know, we should stay in the past mm. uh, and don't get involved in, in modern political dogfights. And and I, do, yeah. do you get invited to interviews and comment on current affairs, as it were? Uh, no, and I would, to be honest, I would kind of, uh, you know, a little bit shy away from that because I, there's that veers into um, sort of the abuse of the history to some degree, where it's, it's overtly politicised. And I don't, I don't see that necessarily as my area. I'll have to cross off the next three questions I have for Roger on those very subjects. Um, Roger, are you working on any particular Poland-related project now that you can share with us? Uh, I've, got, I've just finished, delivered a text um, to both my British and Polish publishers, um, which is on 
the September campaign of 1939. Yes, very uh, forgotten in absolutely all of those. Absolutely, another one, you know, another completely forgotten subject, really. The Western historiography, the English language historiography is minuscule on the September campaign. Most of it is completely wrong. Uh, most of it just feeds off uh, German propaganda from the time. Um, the Soviets are, are uh, conspicuous by their absence from the narrative <laughs> entirely, which is also wrong. Um, so, you know, there's, again, there's a huge field there for me to, to try and, uh, you know, fill, really. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do with the book. So that's out in uh, September of this year, which is the 80th anniversary of the, of the, um, of the battles that it describes. Um, very interesting book, I, I hope. I hope the readers agree. Um, and then what's after that? I'm not sure. There's, uh, you know, I've, I'm in, sort of increasingly drawn into Polish circles. So I, I, I teach at Natolin, the College of Europe in Natolin. Um, I have a, a visiting position there. Um, so I, I'm, I was in Warsaw last week. I'm back in Warsaw now. I'm going to be in Gdańsk next week. So increasingly now I'm sort of drawn into this uh, I think Roger just basically has to Polish history. bite the bullet and move over to Warsaw uh, from, from, from half I'm not sure my wife would like that, <laughs> but, uh, you know... Uh, the things have improved since, uh, <laughs> since uh, um, and of course you run uh, through historical trips, field trips to uh, uh, Poland. You go from Gdańsk to Warsaw to Krakow, and you yeah. cover many of the events you just talked about. Yes, again, it's, and it's part of that, you know, attempt to sort of popularise history to to bring people into this uh, this world. Um, and I've I've done that. So I did this Poland at War tour that you just described, which is eight days, um, and I've had. Uh, predominantly British customers, a few Americans and so on as well. But very often you have people that, that at the end of that week, and it's a quite an emotional week, um, and they will come up to me and say, I had no idea about this stuff. Mm. I had no idea. Um, which I, I think, well, brilliant. You know, that's what that's, now you have. You know. Is it more satisfying because you're actually meeting your readers, as it were? Uh, I, I do. It's, it's the slog it's of tough. the book. It's hard work. It yeah. is hard work. Um, you know, you're sort of you're on duty all the time. Part of what we, you know, part of the sell with the with the uh, the tours is that is that you're sort of on duty all the time. So you know, meal times you're there. If you, there's that burning question that someone has about whatever it is, the our car or something like that, they all can come and ask it. Um, so that's part of the deal. It's not like I disappear into my into my uh, uh, gilded chamber or a sleep <laughs> pod, <laughs> well, sleep, yeah. uh, oxygen yeah. pod. So it, it, I mean, it is it is it is emotionally uh, and and intellectually quite hard work. So, but it's very rewarding. Yeah. Finally, a very tough question: favorite mm. book about Poland that isn't uh, or doesn't have the surname Morehouse or Davies <laughs> on? Um, so I suppose related to Poland, um, I would have to go with something like Timothy Snyder's Bloodlands. Tough book. Absolutely tough book. Um, you know, very tough read. Obviously, it's a bigger subject than, than just Poland, but Poland's very much at the heart of those bloodlands that he describes. Um, and again, I think, uh, you know, Tim Snyder's another one, I think, is, is an inspirational historian. He always takes a slightly different view, always thought-provoking, uh, and I thought that was a brilliant book. Roger, thank you very much. I could very easily sit with you for another two and a half days, but such is life. We don't do two and a half day uh, filming shoots on Heart of Poland. Please do share this episode with anyone you know who's interested in the fascinating history of Poland and, of course, writers like Roger who are helping to carve our understanding of that history. Make sure you share it wherever you find it, be it Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, or any of those other modern uh, youth-based uh, social media sites. And I'll see you again for the next episode of Heart of Poland. <laughs>